right, so today will be a little bit more like a, a, a standard class day. Now, today technically the chapter one homework is due, and so normally what I would uh, I, what I would do is, is offer one of you guys to, to do the, your presentation section for the class by going over the homework with the class. Since I haven't organized that up yet, quite yet, um, what I'm going to do is instead just allow you to ask three free ones of the homework that I assigned. So if you would like to hear my response to three of the different questions that I assigned on the homework, you are more than welcome to ask at this stage. So were there three questions on the first three homework assignment sections that potentially were vague that you'd like to say, hear me go about how I would solve it? You guys are basically okay with the chapter one homework? Okay, pick one. Twelve. Twelve, alright. What does number twelve ask us to do? Uh, this, this is the section where it's asking A, is it qualitative or quantitative? Uh -huh. B, if the, data, if the data is quantitative, classify it as discrete or continuous. Well, uh, um, Hang on, hang on. Discrete, continuous, okay. And then C, is it nominal or ordinal? I can't read, I'm so sorry. Nominal, ordinal, ratio. Yeah. What's the last one? Interval. Interval. Uh, or ratio. Vice versa, right? Interval ratio? Yeah. Is there a part D? Uh, no, just C, and then 12 was the size of t-shirts on sale. Size of t-shirts. So, first off, are size of t-shirts qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative. Qualitative, why? Uh, because the size is not numbers. Yeah, it's not a, a number. Now, what happens, though, if they were asking for the actual size of a t-shirt and, and, and the shirts were like, Size 0, size 2, size 4, size 6, size 8. Is that quantitative? No. Yeah. Oh, no. It's not actual numbers. Good question. I mean, think about it, right? I mean, if you think about, you know, like, I mean, I don't know, for, for men's pant sizes, right, they've got a waist and a length, right? It's a 30, 34, or whatever, right? Is that qualitative or quantitative? Would it still be qualitative because it's a category, not an actual like number number? Well, but it's a number that represents circumference of your waist and length of your leg, right? Does that make it quantitative? Teach me. There you go. So these are the sorts of things where this is a purposefully vague question, which is why I was really glad you asked it. This is the one I make a, a student do in class, and then I start asking those sorts of questions. What do they mean by sizes of t-shirts on sale? If they're talking about small, medium, large, extra small, extra, extra large, etc., etc., those are category. Categorical, right? They are qualitative. If, on the other hand, you're measuring a very specific size, and so the sizes are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, where the sizes actually mean something, I, I don't know, are, are, do women's clothes sizes actually mean something when they say it's a size 5 or a size 8 or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know. I I don't know. I don't want to know necessarily. But does it have a measurable quantity to it? I mean, is it literally tied to a measurement? Not really. If it's not literally tied to a measurement, then it's still qualitative and not quantitative. Okay? So in this case, I would agree that women's sizing, if it's not measuring something specifically, this number is just a category of 
where are you comparatively to the rest of the universe, right? Where, say, a size 8 is normal and a size 7 is smaller than normal, size 6 is slightly small, etc. down the line, right? Those would be categories where they've just given them some sort of numeric value. And now, so, so that's, again, it kind of depends on where you're at, right? Because if, if the shirt size literally is a measurement of how long is it versus how wide is the neck versus how long is the sleeve, and they're measuring those numbers and giving them to you, then it starts to become quantitative. This is why you have to ask questions and be specific, okay? Statistics is often thrown around as extremely vague concepts, and as soon as you get anything in a statistical reference that is vague, you should pounce on it like there's no tomorrow, all right? And demand <coughs> details, all right? So, so part of what I, th this first chapter about is, one, getting used to the sort of things that you use to describe things, but two, to remind you that that's really part of your goal in this class, is to be critical of not just yourself, but everybody else who's either doing or pretending to do statistics, okay? And this is a classic example of where are they potentially not being specific enough. All right, so regardless, though, I would like to think that this is going to be qualitative and not quantitative. Would an example of quantitative, like, clothing of sizes be like a men's, jet, a men's like, suit jacket? So where like, it's talking about waist? Yes, it's talking yes. about waist. Uh -huh. Where it's measuring long. the 44 long, where it's a 44 mm -hmm. width around, and then there's going to be 43 and 42. Okay. That's a, an actual measurement that you can use as a basis. Then, yes, that starts to become quantitative. And that's where you kind of have to, and, but, but even then, if you think about it, right, it's 42 medium, 42 short, 42 long. Does the medium short long make it qualitative? Or do you look at those as two separate pieces of information where the, the length of the, the width of the waist that they're measuring is a, there's a quantitative number, whereas the length, small, medium, long, Maybe that's categorically qualitative. Right, so again, being a little bit cautious with your data as to when should it, should it or should it not be split up. So me personally, I'd like to think shirt size qualitative. Now, since it's qualitative, you don't have to worry about discrete or continuous. That only really applies to something that is quantitative in measure. And then because it's qualitative, note, folks, If you're qualitative, you have to be nominal or ordinal. If you're quantitative, you must be interval or ratio. If you've mixed and matched those things, you have definitely made a boo-boo. So please take a peek at your answers to that particular section and make sure that you haven't told me something is qualitative, but then somehow ratio, because that makes no sense whatsoever. Okay? So for us, folks, is this nominal or ordinal? Ordinal, why is it ordinal? Yeah, because you can compare, right? Each, whether it's categories with small, medium, large, or apparently women's sizing based on a zero through whatever the number is that it goes through, those are all comparative. So in this instance, I would say that this is ordinal information. All right, not bad? Again, it's one of those where part of it is also getting used to book questions on statistics, which are just weird. Because a lot of times you get stuff that it's, they purposely make things that are not real worldly so that they can be odd and force you to have to think a little bit more. So bear with the book to some degree. All right. How'd you do on that one? How did you how, how do you feel about it now? <laughs> okay. No, folks, this is this is why this is why I, I say to students that homework, I would like it on Mondays, but if we come in on a Monday and we go over some of the questions and you realize that, oh crap, I did them all wrong, that's why I give you till Wednesday to turn it in. Okay? So as long as you know if you if you are happy with the homework after we go over maybe one or two more, you're more than welcome to turn it in. If you would like to spend maybe a little bit more time on it now that we've gone over it, because now you kind of see how the book 
questions work and you'd like to maybe go back and maybe change some of them, I'll understand. As long as homework is turned in before class on Wednesday, we're all good. Okay? So, now that you've seen me do one, questions on another one? Maybe. Number 30 from 1.1? All right, what does 30 in section 1.1 say? Uh, so you have to decide the following statements are an example of descriptive or inferential statistics. Okay, so hang on, hang on. Descriptive versus inferential. Okay. The number 30 was the average number of hours vacationers spend in national parks during the summer months is 4.5 hours. Average stay in national parks is 4.5 hours. Yes. This is inferential, right? Because without pulling every single vacation or in national parks during every single summer month, we're not going to have this. Right, so descriptive statistic is a measurement that you have made specifically, right? So did they tell you that they measured every single park and got all of the data for every single park in the entire United States for every month of the summer? No, therefore they're inferring from some data that they got that this is the average over four and a half hours, all right? So they have to be giving you some very specific data in order for you to call it descriptive, otherwise it is going to all right. So part of that is, is a little bit of an of a explanation, right? So what I, what I say in statistics a lot of times is that the right answer is inferential. But if you told me that this was descriptive and explained why, and your explanation said because you have worked for the national park system, and because you know that the national park system has exactly how many hours every person has stayed in every national park on every day, if you know that that's true, and can therefore tell me that that's true, then I would say, oh, okay. Then it could be a descriptive statistic. Again, remember, st descriptive statistics have to be coming from data. All right? It has to be coming from data. And if there's no way that that data can necessarily exist, then in theory, this, date, this you know, explanation has to be inferred from additional data somewhere else, or slightly less than every piece of information that's going on. All right? So again, that's one of those where you got to be just a little bit cautious. But explanations where you tell me why something is one way or another is a good way of making sure that if your answer is potentially wrong, if you had a different interpretation of the problem, because your history is different than mine, you may still be right even though your answer is different than mine, okay? This is where statistics is slightly a social science versus a mathematical science. You can have the wrong answer, but as long as you have explained it in such a way that it's correct for the situation you're looking at, I can give you credit for it, okay? So again, it's one of those where I'm perfectly happy with you just giving me one-word answers to these types of questions, but explanations are almost always Okay. Again, that, that, this is why I want to go over a, a few of these so that you can get that kind of a feel for how the homework works in this class. There will be times where the 
the types of questions that, that the book asks are things like, what is 4 plus 5? And if you tell me that 4 plus 5 is 7, because where you grew up, 4s are really 2s. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I will kind of just put an X through it and say, what? And, and we will move forward, okay? So when it asks for what's 4 plus 5, please put down 9, okay? All right, so thank you for asking. I'll give you one more. How about 1.3 question 26? 1.3 question 26. All right, so good. Get one in every section. All right, so. All right, so what does number 26 say? So uh, asking you to identify sampling techniques, and 26 is a student asking all the people living on the first, fifth, and eighth floors of his dorm to answer a survey. Survey floors in a dorm, first, fifth, and eighth floors. Okay. So what did, what did you think that one was? So why did you say stratify? Um, it's subdividing by some sort of method. Okay. Um, stratify, though, would be more along the lines of you line everybody up and you say, I'm going to take every fourth person or every eighth person. Isn't that systematic? Yes. So. So, so, okay, so how would you imply the, the stratify from this then? Um, you have some group, which would be the students in the building, and you subdivided them into some sort of smaller groups to sample from. I, I agree, but, but the idea then would be that you would be gra grabbing a certain number of people from the first floor and a certain number of people from the fifth floor and a certain number of people from the eighth floor. This guy is saying that he's asking everybody on the first floor, everybody on the fifth floor, and everybody on the eighth floor. And that's what separates cluster versus stratify. So the cluster here are the floors in the building. And he's asking everybody in the cluster and saying that's what's making it random. And that's the difference between stratified versus cluster. A cluster, you're going to ask everybody in a subgroup. A stratify says you ask a certain number of people in every one of the subgroups. So if you said stratify for this one, that would assume you were going to ask, say, 10 students in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, however many floors. That's sort of the difference. So the correct answer to this one really is cluster. Okay? And I'm glad you asked. Because that is a slightly fuzzy piece as to the difference between cluster and, and stratify. Or cluster and, oh yeah, stratify, not system. All right? And do you think that's a good way of, of sampling the dorm room or the dorm facility? Ask everybody on the first, fifth, and eighth floors? Why not? Good question. Could be co-ed dorms. Co dorms, and perhaps these are the only co-ed floors, right? That, that, that's actually the way it was in one of my brother's dorms, is that it was only the third and the sixth floor that were co-ed, and the second and third and fifth and et cetera were all one sex or the other. It was really weird. I was a boy, girl, boy, boy. Really? Yeah. Again, no, whatever. Mine were, when I was in school, it was totally separate dorms. It was, there was no so, so would you be okay with someone sampling a, a, a facility by doing that? It, would you believe their statistics if they came up with numbers from it? What sort of bias, what sort of bias might exist because of this? I mean, we already saw potentially one, right? So one could be that these floors may not be cohabitation floors, right? Maybe the first, fifth, and eighth floors are, are male only. And 
this question that you're asking may need to have both a male and a female perspective. Right? So that's one that may create a bias. Can you think of any other? Like three out of eight floors can ask when there's five that's not. Yeah. But is it going to make basically a random survey? It's not half, though. Well, you don't have to ask half the people. That's way, 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 way impossible. If you wanted to ask half the people in Wisconsin a survey, you would never get a real survey then. Statistically, it's okay, numerically wise. There, three out of eight is, is probably good enough, assuming that there's not like two people that live on a floor. What other sorts of reasons would you consider this to be biased? Well, he could be choosing those floors specifically because the, act, the person who's asking knows who lives there, right? So there could be a personal bias into it, which is a little scary and not all that uncommon, right? The other thing that I usually say about this sort of thing is that people that live on the same floor, they tend to choose to live on the, on the same floor. Right? I mean, if you're not the same type of people, are you going to live on the same floor as other people who are not? Not very often. We tend to self-stratify ourselves when we choose living places, right? I mean, that's part of what happens out there in the real world is that there are clusters of people of a specific belief system that tend to live together, right? And a lot of times they create homeowners associations to guarantee that there are only the people that they want to live in their communities that can buy a house in the community, right? I mean, that actually literally happens out there in the real world. So grabbing data where you have specifically forced a cluster to exist that may force a bias because everybody on the fifth floor is, you know, is a, is a liberal and maybe everybody on the eighth floor is, you know, uh, you know, in, on, on a green card here, and everybody on the first floor is female, right? For for whatever reason, now you've built in a, a natural bias to the system, whether you like it or not. So you have to be a little bit cautious when you just sort of look at it and glance at it and say, "Well, yeah, sure, why not?" It's, I agree, it's probably an okay way of doing it, but there's real easy ways to see a bias existing it. And again, that's part of our job as statisticians to look at the data and say. Did they build a bias in who they asked? So what you're trying to say is that this should have been stratified all along. That might not have been a bad way to do it, is to say, hey, let's pick, you know, a certain number of them from us from different floors so that we have a more truly random selection because we know people choose very specifically to live close to people that are very much like them. And we have maybe created a bias by choosing this method, right? Be Again, that's, that's just the sort of, all of this stuff, this is where, again, I apologize to some degree, because statistics is a bit hand-waving when it gets here, right? And that, what is a bias, you have to be careful, right? And look for it relatively deeply, and know something about humanity because of it. And so, seeing that people who live together are creating a bias in your selection system, you should know that, and now, from now on, whenever you ask, somebody asks you or says something about a statistic, and they say, well, I sampled, you know, 100 homes that were in one neighborhood. And it's like, okay, that's fine for that neighborhood, but you would better not use that to describe the entire city, right? Because there's no way that one neighborhood describes an entire city. That sort of analysis of data is something that you guys should get into the habit of trying to do whenever you look at a statistical piece of information. All right? And again, I... Most of this class is geared to not doing this kind of stuff, all right? From this week on, we are basically going to turn the crank on those statistical calculations that we have to do. And we will very rarely come back to this. But it's something that if we had like a, a full year statistics class, I would probably spend four to six weeks talking about how do you nitpickily design, you know, piece up data to determine whether or not someone has created a bias from their sample, because that's a huge piece of statistics that we kind of all gloss over and say, oh, everybody who does statistics is ethical and will randomly choose people using one of these good methods of doing it, whether it's clustered or stratified or systematic. And the fact is, is that that probably happens less frequently than not. All right, so again, I, I, 
I won't harp on this because from a strictly class-based setting, you won't have to worry about this more than the second group, right? And we will make an assumption on a regular basis that the way you sampled the data was a good random sample. How you did it? I would wave my hands. And that's just a matter of you being as careful as you can and moving forward accordingly. So, again, I, again, I just cautious you, caution you against looking at data and getting where the data comes from as often as you can. Right? If you, you see someone quote up a statistic, they don't tell you anything about how they sampled the data, don't believe it, period. And that, that should just be the way it is, period. If they don't tell you even a little bit about where they chose the data from, assume that they did it in a fashion that makes whatever they're trying to sell look better. Okay? So please be careful. All right? So. How do we feel about chapter one? All right, well, if you are happy with your homework and you would like to turn it in, I would love to have it. Please do not forget to put your name on it. I don't know you guys well enough yet to, to get away with that. Eventually, I'd like to think I, I will know all of your names, but until then, keep writing it down. Sorry. All right, so, mm. All right, so, again, I sort of wish we could spend more time on this, but there just really isn't the time to do it. All right, so. So chapter two, talking about data. So this assumes that, it, you know, we're assuming now in chapter one that you guys have an understanding of what it means to get a good random sample, or as good a random sample as you can get. Again, a lot of that is a little bit hand wavy, but bear with me to some degree. Now, once you get the data, how do you show people what you got? So first off, realize that in today's day and age, data is, it can be a little bit broadly defined, right? So there's a lot more information that we can gather when we, when we go to get statistical information than we used to. So a lot of this sort of a analysis that we're going to do here in Chapter 2 is a little, a little outdated, but it's not necessarily something that you should ignore. But regardless, um, sort of start at the basics, all right? So frequency distributions are sort of the basics, all right? And I'm going to start even a little bit lower than the way the book does, just to sort of get you into the swing of what I mean by a frequency distribution. So one of the things that I do every summer up in Madison, where I live, is I volunteer my time for the music festivals that, that are run by the, you know, the east side neighborhood in Madison, all right? So there's some La Fête de Marquette and, uh, and some other types of music festivals that go on up in Madison. And I, all, I, I volunteer at least an hour every summer to one of those events, all right? And because I've been doing it for years and years, I always get to pick where I get to volunteer my time at, right? So the first five years I, I volunteered, I, I did garbage detail. If you've ever done garbage at a music festival, 
It's kind of gross. So after those first five years, they basically told me that I could just pick where I worked from there on, okay? So it was kind of nice. But the way they did it is that in Madison, you can volunteer to be in the beer tent. So when you serve beer at these events, it's all done by volunteers. And so the way it goes in Madison is that there's usually like two or three different taps of local Dane County type beers. There's two or three taps that are called imports, which is anything that's not made in Dane County. So like Miller is imported because it comes from Milwaukee. So we call it an import, which is hilarious. We all like that. And then, and then since it's Madison, and it's Madison, you have to also serve wine. People in Madison are kind of smooth. So you gotta have wine. Because the people that show up at some of these music festivals actually show up like in like, you know, like work clothes and they look nice. And so they don't want to be drinking a beer out of a plastic cup. They want to be drinking wine out of a plastic cup. <coughs> Sorry, I was gonna try to do that with a straight face. And then they often sell hard liquor on the side. And so the way we keep track of what we sell when we're working the, the beer tent, we have domestics, we have import, we have wine, and we have well. And we just have a chalkboard, and we, we keep track of the chalkboard on a one-hour basis, because you can't volunteer at the, at the beer tent for longer than an hour. Because, of course, the other condition of, of volunteering at a beer tent is you drink free while you're there. So if you're there for longer than an hour, it's not so good sometimes. So, anyways, um, the idea is that every hour they keep track of what's going on. And the way you do it is that if a group of people walk up and they say, oh, there's a group of, say, four guys, they say, we need eight beers. Because if there's four, they've all got two hands. You've got to have a beer in each hand. So eight beers. And they will often order eight domestics. And so... How do we keep track of selling eight domestic beers? Old school. But maybe we don't have cash registers at these things. It's all sort of volunteer type stuff. So there's not a whole lot of power where you punch in the number and you have to tell exactly what. Because we don't, you don't care, right? So you just keep track of it. So, so another group of people walks up and they buy imports. Maybe there was only two of them. It's Madison. Everybody buys it in pairs. And then maybe a nice couple comes along and they say, oh, we'd like to have wine. And you're like, oh, great. And so you get out the, the one-gallon jug of wine that says Gallo on it, and that's all it says. It's not exactly high-class wine. Right. So you pour them a couple of wines. And then I also, when I work, I only work in the afternoons because then it's not quite so crazy in the beer tent. I mean, it's, you, know, you get into a beer tent at a music festival in Madison at about 9, and it's... You're just basically touring nonstop. It's scary. And then you don't have time to drink your three drinks, right? So, I mean, that's, that beats the purpose. So, anyways, you keep track old school, right? So, you keep having people show up. Every now and then you sell some wells. So suppose it was a slow day. Suppose this was like Friday, right? Very, very low sales Friday early in the afternoon. And let's assume that here was the dollar prices, right? Uh, domestics were costing four bucks, not five. Those were imports. So domestics are four dollars. Imports are five dollars. Wine is six dollars. Wells are eight dollars, right? Whatever. So there is there is money associated. Now, this is a perfectly good way to get data, folks, right? I mean, it's meaningful. We all know what it means. But how are we going to show this data when the day is done? Or, in this case, the hour. Uh-huh, exactly. We create a frequency distribution. So a frequency distribution, folks, is just a table Your data, whatever your data is, whether it's money or you know, whatever the number represents, right? And then how many times did you sell that one specific item, right? So four dollar, five dollar, six dollar, and eight dollar items. How many four dollar items did I sell? Twenty-five. 
22. How many imports did I sell? 12. How many wines did I sell? 7. And how many well drinks did I sell? 3. And this is your classic frequency distribution of data. Okay? And it can potentially come from good old fashioned catalogs. Nothing wrong with it, it's just old school. All right? In general, this is sort of what we mean by frequency tables, okay? Data frequency, all right? Now, what's the most important piece of this table? The dollars or the frequency? Why? True, true, but in order to get the money, you have to have both of them, right? So it's kind of both, right, to some degree. So, so which ones, from that perspective, they're both equally as important. So which one of these is more important? It's my question. So in other words, how, how about this? How would you store this information if you weren't using tally marks? How would you keep track of your information? And, and assuming I also did not have a cash register. You would look at how much you ordered and gears and stuff like that. And the, uh... Difference and difference between our, yeah, you could try and do that. It's one of those weird things that since we don't have a button that always dispenses the same amount. I guess it's one is different, but like, yeah. you're looking at like True. Yeah, that stuff is, is a little bit is a little bit nicer. But the idea then, sort of what I'm trying to get at, and I'm probably not asking the right question, is the way a computer would store this information. Right. Yeah. I mean, it would just the other way that you could keep track of this information is instead of setting up. A table for each one of the numbers, just write the numbers down while you're going, right? So when you sold 12 $4 beers, you write four down 12 times. And then after you sell six $5 beers, you write a five down six times, right? So that's the other way that you can get data in a more classic computerized world. You get data in a comma delimited list, all right? So if you're looking at data from a computational perspective, it's often just a bunch of numbers separated by columns. All right. So the frequency is just an affectation of the fact that you're looking at your data and doing something to say, I can simplify this. Okay. So frequency tables are supposed to simplify your analysis of the data, a way to group it in a nice set of eight numbers instead of right, a big, huge, long list of numbers with commas. Looking at a big, long list of numbers with commas in between is simple. But if you're a statistician, you have done it in your past. That's part of the game, right? A lot of times you'll get information that's, that's just this, and then you have to somehow do something with it. Life sucks when that happens, by the way. OK. I mean, you can do it, right? You just count all the fours up. and It's not like it's impossible. It just sucks, all right? All right, so anyways, these are your generic ways of gathering frequency information. All right, now, um, a little bit more common way of dealing with data is to talk about grouped frequency data. So the nice thing about our information on that last example is that we're, there were only four numbers we were working with, right? Four, five, six, and eight. And those were the only four numbers that ever showed up, right? Because we only sold $4, $5, $6, or $8 items. Is that the way it works in the real world? Of course not, right? In the real world, you're selling things that have lots of different price values all over the place, OK? So Let's suppose that I have a bunch of information that represents people's test grades. Right? So here's a bunch of data for you, given to you in the classic computational way, of people getting grades in my class. Uh, 
many did I put up there? A bunch of numbers. So my first question to you is, with this data, would I create a frequency table that was similar to the one I created just a minute ago? I could, right? But basically, what will I be doing if I do that? Yeah, I would just be rewriting the row and the, 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 the data in a table instead of in a bunch of commas separating the numbers. Because very few of the numbers repeat. Did I repeat at least one or two of those? Uh, okay. Yeah, I got 82 there twice. Woohoo! All right. So, so obviously, creating the type of frequency table we we created last time is obviously out of the question. Okay? Because that's just silly. We may as well just work with this set of numbers, and then that's okay. So the other way that you can go about dealing with data is to say, hey, let's create some groups of the data. Ranges, exactly. So that's exactly the way you want to look at it. Ranges of data. All right, so what kind of ranges should I create for this data? What do you think? What was that? Letter grades. Very good thing to think about. If the data means something outside of the numeric value that you're getting, that may naturally create a set of ranges for you. Normally, grading scales tend to be 90, 80, 70, 60, right? So you may want to create your data such that your ranges come in groups of 10, right? Not necessarily a bad thing to do. Now, the question is, if that data isn't defined into letter grades, let's suppose that this were just random data, how would you decide what ranges to create? What do you think you might do? What, what might you guys do? Why fives or tens? Well, because fives will, like, uh, fives will give you a better, more accurate idea than, like, saying tens is a broad sort of... True, true, but... I'm to say. but what does the range dictate? When you, when you pick fives, what's that going to do to the table that I draw here? It's going to make it long. It's going to make it kind of long. Right. Right? So one of the things that you have to fight against is that sort of two-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. You'd know more about your data if you made your ranges narrower. But the problem with it that is that that then increases the number of ranges that you have, which makes the table really long. Mm -hmm. Where is the nice, even number of rows to work with. And that really, I'm not going to tell you that there is one right number of rows in your table. Uh, that doesn't exist. Okay, But what you need to do when you start gathering the data is determine at some point in time what the right number of rows is. And note that the number of rows is really also called class. Distribution is one row. Okay? So just a little terminology. So, how many classes are we going to have for this particular table? If we go by, say, tens, because the grading system sort of naturally sets that up. Six, seven, seven. Why seven? Because we have seven different um, leading numbers. We have seven different leading numbers, right? Thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties. So we're going to have to have seven rows. Seven, generally, folks, is considered about the most number of rows you should have in general. 
It's not a hard number. You can have more than seven. But generally speaking, we as humans, once we get to a table that has more than eight, nine, or ten rows, too many rows, too much data to look at, not, not necessary for us to see. Seven or less, better. So normally, what you should try and do is to sort of look at your data and say, what is a natural sequence of numbers to choose such that I have somewhere between four, five, six, or seven rows? Okay? Again, that's not, that's not hard, solid facts. That's just a general social science analysis of looking at tables and how quickly people don't bother to look at the tables when they're given them. So one of the, one of the interesting things that I used to do in graduate school when I was taking my statistics class is that we did surveys. And so we handed students, so we were at University of Arizona, we would tell like 100 students, hey, if you take this survey, 10 bucks, but you gotta spend at least a half an hour in the room. And they're like, 10 bucks for half an hour? That's getting paid $20 an hour? Sign me up, right? I mean, think about it being a student, right? I mean, this is, you know, if you get a free 20 bucks, free 10 bucks for basically just taking a survey? Hell yeah, right? I mean, come on, you don't get paid that much if you donate plasma. Not that I would know. Or I would. But anyways, so you know, so we had people who were constantly signing up to do these things. And that was one of the things that we studied was how long will people look at a table? Where's the cutoff point? And it was somewhere between about eight and nine on our our samples at least. But again, interesting social study. Alright, so our data. Should you start at the highest numbers or the lowest numbers? Doesn't matter. Whichever one you like more, doesn't it doesn't really matter for the most part. Kind of depends on what you care about more than anything else. Again, I tend to start at the lower numbers and go to the higher numbers, but that's just the way I am. It doesn't have to be that way. All right. Now, how are we going to define these ranges? What's my lowest number up here? 36. Should I start at 36? Why not? You want to have them be a clean set of ranges, okay? So if you're dealing with a range of essentially 10, you should probably set it up so that the 10s are easily seen, right? So do 30 to 39. And please make sure that once you set up a sequence, the sequence is continual from that point forward even if there's no data in any of those particular classes, okay? And you can see, right, even once you get down to that last row, what do you start to notice, folks? Yeah, you don't want to write anymore. You don't want to see anymore either. That's already starting to get a little bit overboard. All right? So, again, it's one of those where... Now, I didn't warn you. Did you guys start this table way, 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 way over on the left-hand side and give yourself lots of room to the right? Me. Right. We are going to have... Lots and lots of columns in this table. My bad. I'm sorry. We're not just going to have frequency following it, folks. We're going to have a lot of extra columns that come after it. So bear with me a little bit. But the very first column is just what you expected it to be, frequency. So how many numbers are there between 30 and 39? How many are there between 40 and 49? Between 50 and 59? Oh, I put one in the table. Why is this over there? One. Between 60 and 69? Three. How many between 70 and 79? Five, eighty, and eighty-nine. Nice and then last but not 
Valley's 9 to 99? And one of the things that you should always do, and this is sort of implied, is make sure that the number of numbers that you have up here is the same as the sum of your frequencies down there, right? I mean, I'd like to think that that's implicit, but I'm going to say it just to be safe. All right, so so note again, first off, once you have a pattern created for your classes, the pattern must always repeat. That's just a straight up, you have to do it that way, folks. Please don't ever change that. Now, other things that you need inside of a table or other things that you can add in a table if necessary. So all of these extra columns I'm going to put in, folks, are not required, but they may be helpful for displaying your data or for the use in your display of data later on in a statistical study. All right? So just bear with me as I go sort of through all the other things that you can have. So first off, class width. What is the class width of our classes, folks? It's the difference between the beginning or end ranges in any one of our classes. So what's the difference between 30 and 40? 10. So the range between the actual successive beginnings or successive endings should always be the same number. Okay? So in this case, our class width is going to be 10. And note, once it's 10, it's always 10. Basically, the class boundary is where you round things into these specific ranges. So imagine, if you will, that some of these test scores were not whole numbers. They could have halves or quarters or tenths of a point. Where would we put them based on how you round, right? So the class boundaries are just the, the, the averages between the upper and the lower limits from successive ranges, all right? So what is the average of 39 and 40? How do you average 39 and 40? Add them together and divide by 2. So what do you get when you add 39 and 40? 79. What's half of 79? 90. What's half of 79, folks? 4.5. What, how do you, how do you, 39 and a half, right? The average of two numbers that are one unit apart is halfway in between both of them, right? 39 and a half, okay? So the, the upper boundary point for this particular range is 39 and a half. And so is the lower boundary range of this one. Now, what's the upper boundary range? What's the average of 49 and 50? Nope. 
Okay, now that you get it, 49 and a half. Just adding these two numbers, 79. Divide by two. Just average the two numbers. The average of 39 and 40 is. When you divide by 70, whatever, to divide by two, why do you know who that is? The average of 39 and 40 is 79. Divided by two, right? Okay. And what are going to be the rest of the numbers, folks? Uh huh. Again, this is just particular data that you may or may not want to show in your table. And so what should the number, the lower run number be up here, folks? Patterns always have to be consistent. Yes, 29 and a half. So one of the things about every type of grouped frequency table that you have, it has to be consistent patterns, right? So one of the things that statistics will drill into your brain is that patterns have to be there. They have to be consistent all the time. So one of the other things that you may or may not want to show in your table is the midpoint, if I could spell midpoint correctly. Midpoint. The midpoint of any range or of any class is just the average of the upper and lower within the class itself. So how do you average 30 and 39? What's going to be the next midpoint? Because what are all the patterns for all of our ranges? Add 10. Add 10, add 10. You can calculate it every time if you want, but once you start to see the pattern, just be able to repeat it. It's the average of a successive upper and lower bound. And now all of this, I'm going to give you all of this information on one table. And what I'm going to point out to you when we're done is that rarely do you have all of this data when you show it in a particular report. But based on what sorts of graphical information you display, you may or may not want different of these columns showing up in your table, all right? It really depends more on what sort of graphical information you're going to display as to whether or not you show this data in your statistical study if you're doing it, all right? All right, so the next one. Is relative frequency. Does anybody know what relative frequency means? How often it happens compared to everything else. How often it happens compared to everything else, exactly. So what would be the relative frequency of the first class? One out of? Out of 18, right? Now, note how I sort of wrote that fraction off to the left a little bit. How do normal humans feel about fractions? They, they tend not to like them too terribly much, right? So a fraction can often be written by a, represented by a percentage instead. You are more than welcome to convert relative frequency into its percentage. Somebody with a calculator handy do 1 divided by 18 and tell me what the percent is roughly. Zero 
So like 5.6%, let's say we round to the tenths. And again, it's entirely up to you whether you leave it as a fraction, leave it as a percentage, or show both of those pieces of information. You gotta have at least one. Me personally, I'm perfectly okay with fractions, so when I did reports and had relative frequency in them, I just left them as a fraction and said, you guys can deal with fractions, handle it. Entirely up to you. So what's the relative frequency of the 40 to 49 class? Same. If, if the stuff is the same, folks, don't recalculate it. Just, you know, copy it, right? Since the frequency in each one of these is one, run with it. How about the 60 to 69 range? Three out of 18. Simplify that fraction. One over six, which is point one six 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 six. Approximately sixteen point seven percent. How about five eighteenths? Point seven, point seven, that's it. So it'd be 27.8. 27.8? Yeah, there's yeah. eight at the end. So cool. 3.18, there's another one we've already done. And then 4.18, bummer. One of those where a lot of these you can you know sort of quick like rattle off the algebra or rattle off the, uh, the statistical calculation if you want shouldn't take too terribly much all right all right so relative frequency I should give myself more room but the next one is cumulative frequency what is Cumulative mean? Total, to some degree. So, what is the cumulative frequency of the 30 to 39 range? Yeah, it's just one. Because there's nothing before it, right? So, you don't have to accumulate anything. You don't have to add anything. Now, what's the cumulative frequency of the 40 to 49 range? So the idea here is that you add the frequencies while you go. You're accumulating them. So in other words, you're going to end up with your total number at the bottom. So what's cumulative to the 50 to 59 class? Three. 60 to 69. Six. And now you sort of see the pattern. Add the frequency as you go. So what was it then? Well, sum of all frequencies prior to this frequency. And the idea here is that if you wanted to know how many people failed this test, you could look at the cumulative frequency of everybody below 60, and you say, oh, there were three people that failed this test. Or if you consider failing to be a D or an F, you can say, oh, well, that's all the people that are from 60 and below, 69 and below. That's six people. The cumulative sort of gives that kind of information that you need. All right? And then there's one last one. Relative cumulative frequency. If it's relative cumulative, what are we going to do with every one of those cumulative numbers? Divide them by 18. Exactly. All right? So 1 18th, 2 18th, 3 18th, 6 18th, 11 18th, 18th, not 118th. That would be weird. 11 18th, 14 18th, and 18 18th. 
And again, you are more than welcome to convert all of those into a percentage like you did for relative frequency as well. It's perfectly okay. So if you want, you can slap up here 5.6%. And obviously, once you get to your 18th, because that's everything, you're back at 100%. I don't know. The relative cumulative frequency? Yeah. It's, the rel it, it, it's the relative for the cumulative frequency column. So again, this, this type of analysis, this is very rarely do you see all of this information when you actually look at data on a group frequency table in a real report somewhere. All right? The idea is that each one of these is going to be pertinent for a different type of graphical representation of your data that you're going to do later on. And if you use the graph that needs this data, you should have the data in there. Okay? So, the first pieces, the first two columns, you have to always have. All of these other columns are really dependent upon whether or not you're, you're going to use that information in your, you know, in your data analysis or in your pictorial analysis of your data. All right? So, again, I suppose I was going to try and define these while I was going, and I didn't do a very good job, did I? All right, so class boundaries. What did we call class boundaries definition? Average of successive upper and lower boundaries. And then what was next? Midpoint? Midpoint. And again, you and or make it a percent if you wish. Cumulative frequency. Some frequencies. Relative, cumulative, frequency, and that's just cumulative frequency. And again, this is it's a little overkill on the how all the types of stuff you can do in a particular set of frequency tables, but it's it's good to see it sort of all thrown together just so that you can have the relationships 
that might exist, all right, floating around with you. So, ugh. Yeah, yeah, for the that many still. Yeah, I'm not as fast as far as you. All right, so. Let's take a peek. That's essentially section 2.1. So what did I assign in section 2.1? Basically all the even ones. Except for 12? Yeah. 4 through 18, all the evens except for 12? <laughs> all right, so let's see. Real quick, like, folks. Um, how would you fill out the rest of that table on question number 13 in the book? So part, part of what I want to do is, is, is go over at least one odd question in every section that we do so that you guys can kind of get a flavor of the types of homework questions you work on. So that, again, reference, Tracy. So that you have a reference for how to do the homework when it comes your time, okay? so. Number 13. Note, the answer to this should be in the back of the book somewhere. But how would you finish it out, right? So what are the classes? What was our first class? 1199. What's the next class? class? Rinse and repeat. So all of the things that you are, that are not missed in there, notice once you see a pattern, rinse and repeat. Make sure the pattern is repetitive, right? I don't know how far you have to go for that particular one, but how far does it go? 1600s? Yeah. And then one more, 1600 to 1699. And how would you find the frequencies, folks? Count. Yeah, I mean, go up in the data and count them all. So how many are there for, between 1,100 and 1,199? One, between 1,200 and 1,299? 1,300 and 1,399? Seriously, four all the way down? Awesome. All right. So more or less what you have to do. Note though, if you look at the at the at 16 and 18, those are the ugly ones. Where they want to have everything. Okay? They want to have frequency, they want to have class boundaries, they want to have midpoints, they want to have relative frequency, they want to have cumulative frequency. So those are the big ones. Okay? Where you're basically doing the same thing we just did for my test questions. Alright? I'm trying to, I'm, I'm debating. How about we just make the homework assignments weekly? Does that sound okay? So, so basically, you know, as you can see, we're, we're going to try and get through more or less a chapter a week. Every now and then a chapter will take two weeks. I'm game to just say let's do it once a week, and, and you guys always turn it on Monday. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I, I was starting to get homeworks from all my other classes today, too, and trying to get them turned around that many. Of, yeah, let's, let's just make it a little bit more reasonable and say we'll do once a week. So if I don't get as far as I hope in the syllabus, then I will start scaling the homework back. So, like, for some reason, if on Wednesday we don't make it through all of Chapter 2, then I won't assign all of Chapter 2, but we really should. So should be okay for us to sort of have all of chapter two due next week. But 
I, I'm okay with running it that way. My advice is to not wait until the last minute to do it, but this way then you don't have to try and random run off at least a homework assignment every Monday to a Wednesday, which that turnaround time is a little scary. And I don't want you guys to feel rushed on a Monday through Wednesday when you've only got two days. So why don't we just make it a weekly thing and then we can be like that. All right? Yeah, I figured you guys wouldn't mind too terribly much, but it'll just make life easier on everybody, and then we're okay with it. All right? All right, in that case then, that's enough for today. It's a good stopping point anyway. We will finish up on Wednesday with Chapter 2. We'll draw some pictures. You'll discover that I can't draw. I'll apologize right now, but then we'll move on from there. Yes, I will post the homework problems tonight before I leave. Oh, nice. I know. I figure I'm like, oh, at least I'll get half of it. <laughs> okay. I'm like, this just doesn't seem like Marshall. It normally gives us specific numbers, and I write them down. And I'm like, oh. They all are. started calling off the numbers. I'm like, where is this? Oh, whatever. Eh, it happens. And this is what I get for waiting until today to do it. So. That's true. Yeah. Keeping up is a better idea, Kyle. Yeah. It's the starting of the semester. That's what I'm doing. No, I understand.